All right, let's get started. This is lecture 13, um, and this lecture is going to be a little different um, than some of the other uh, lectures that we've had in the course, because what we're doing uh, in this lecture is specifically introducing the analysis project uh, in the class. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is go through the project scope, some of the parameters. I'm actually going to go through some example computations with you to kind of give you an idea of how the project works. Um, uh, I do want to go through a couple of um, goals and whatnot that I have uh, for the project. Um, so first off, um, I want the project to be um, broad enough in scope that it will allow you to, uh, as structural engineering students, to choose the arrangement uh, of a structure that's going to be uh, analyzed and ultimately um, designed. Um, but I also want it to be narrow uh, enough in scope such that the uh, desired outcome is clear, that you know what you need to deliver uh, at the end of the day. Um, I want you to get a taste of some system level design. I want you to get a taste of some things that you would see in a um, steel design class or a reinforced concrete design class. Uh, so things like uh, a, um, a meeting limit states uh, and whatnot, uh, which is a term that you'll learn uh, if you take a, a structural design class. Um, I do want you to be exposed to a couple of different software packages uh, to assess a real world challenge. Um, and finally, I, I wanna force you to break out CAD again. Um, the final, one of the final deliverables is going to be a CAD drawing of the, um, uh, of the, the, um, the, 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 the trust that you uh, end up sizing. And so I want you to break out CAD again for a little bit. Uh, I've given this project, um, a number of times uh, in the past, um, and most students have, have found the, the project to be enjoyable. Um, it hasn't been a terrible amount of work, um, but uh, it, it's, it's fun, uh, and, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so the goal of the project is to um, detail a bridge that will connect our engineering building to the adjacent Robert C. Byrd Biotech building uh, uh, that you see here. And uh, the idea is that it will be a pedestrian bridge similar to the one that crosses uh, 3rd Avenue. Uh, you can see this is the bridge that crosses 3rd Avenue that carries uh, pedestrian traffic from the biotech building uh, over um, to the uh, 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 campus on 3rd Avenue. And we're going to uh, develop another bridge that connects uh, our building to the biotech building. The actual parameters of the project uh, change from year to year so that you can't use you know, a br bridge from last year, but the overall scope uh, is the same. Um, I wanna go through some relevant background and some, uh, some relevant ideas that you need to, um, that you need to have in order to uh, uh, go through the project. And then we'll actually go through some calculations uh, together to make sure that we're all comfortable with some things. I'm going to get my pen out in case uh, I need it for some of the uh, uh, slides here to come. Uh, okay, so I've mentioned this uh, in class before, but um, whenever we're looking at a structure um, and we are um, trying to uh, uh, analyze and design that structure, we have to know what we're building uh, in order to uh, determine the loads that will be applied to that structure. So, uh, for example, I've mentioned you know, if we're looking at live loads, that the live loads for a, say, ballroom would be different than the live loads for a hospital or, or what have you. Um, and in the the um, land of, of, of structural engineering, we tend to uh, specify those loads as either like a pounds per cubic foot or maybe a pounds per square foot. Uh, and so, for instance, I've got a slide here with some common floor dead loads, and you see we've got... Um, you know, for example, here's, you know, framing, fireproofing, metal deck, and we see each of these um, loads are spec'd out in a pounds per square foot basis. Um, and what we ultimately want to do is we want to be able to take those loads and convert them into uh, loads that we would apply to a common uh, load model um, that, that we've been dealing with uh, this entire semester. Uh, the way that we do that is we use a concept called tributary area. Um, we are going to have some later lectures in the semester that delve into this a little bit more deeply. Um, but in order to negotiate the project, we need to have a little bit of a crash course in tributary area. So what tributary area is, is the, um, the, the area or the region of a structure for which a given element is responsible for. So the tributary area is the loaded area that directly contributes to that member. Um, and it's best defined as the area that's bounded by the lines halfway uh, to the next beam or column. And that, that tends to be the case for most typical structures. It's not always halfway, you know, if we're looking at some more complex like two-way slabs or some, some weird arrangements. Um, but you'll get kind of the idea uh, through some examples I'm going to show you here in a little bit. 
And the idea is to use the loads uh, in concert with uh, tributary area to perform, to perform what's called a load takedown on a structure. So basically looking at each element and drawing a free body diagram for that element and determining the loads that that element uh, is responsible for so that you can be begin analysis and ultimately design. So uh, to give you kind of an idea of what I'm talking about here, so uh, I took here, this is a picture that I took of the uh, floor beams uh, in the 3rd Avenue parking garage uh, at Marshall. So you can see the, um, uh, the, the beams here. And, and this parking garage is made of some precast concrete elements that you can see here. Um, so the idea is, so if we're looking at, I don't know, let's say we're looking at, uh, let's, let's see, let me turn my pen on here. Let's say we're looking at, I don't know, that floor beam right here. Well, the idea is we want to try and figure out how much floor, how much area of floor that that beam is responsible for. And I propose that it is responsible for everything halfway over to the next beam and maybe halfway over to the next beam. So that this shaded area is what that given uh, element is responsible for. Uh, and then the idea is that the beam next to it would be responsible for its halfway over and halfway over and then uh, and so on and so forth. And then the idea is what I can then do is I can then say, okay, I've got this floor beam. I can say, okay, how do I determine that distributed load that goes on that floor beam and then begin uh, structural analysis? Now we'll get into the, the math uh, here in a little bit. Uh, but the one thing I want you to sort of take away from this is sort of a hip bone connected to the leg bone um, uh, 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 type of observation. So for example, where does the load from the floor beams go? So we've got load that's applied to the top of the floor beams that uh, a load, uh, you know, we can idealize as a model, something like this. And then what about the reactions? So the load goes here, then there's these reactions. Where do those reactions go? Well, those reactions go to these, these girders at the end. See, these floor beams get connected to these uh, girders that, are, um, that, are, that you can see right here, okay? And so then now we've got another beam with loads on it. And then th where do those reactions go? Those reactions go to the column. And then where do those uh, loads go? Those loads go to the ground. So that's what I meant when I sort of said this, you know, hip bone connected to the leg bone uh, type of analogy. So if we're looking at a general floor plan, um, the idea is let's say we have this floor plan and the entire floor is subjected to a pressure load. And let's say that pressure load is, I don't know, 25 pounds per square foot, okay? So if I'm looking at a given floor beam, let's say I'm looking at this floor beam right here, the tributary area for that floor beam would be this shaded region right here. And so if I take that 25 pounds per square foot, and specifically what I do, if I take that and I multiply it by the width, right here, this tributary, I'll call it WT, this tributary width, what I can then do is I can develop a model that looks like that, a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. And that's something that, that we as engineers are fairly familiar with. And I can analyze that. I can um, draw shear diagrams and moment diagrams, which we'll discuss uh, a little later. Um, and so I can use that and begin uh, my work as an engineer. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's... Let's do this. Now, if we're looking at the girders, these larger elements here, let's say if we're looking at A2B2, now A2B2 is responsible, just from a tributary area standpoint, it's gonna be responsible for a larger area because we go halfway to the next girder, halfway to the next girder. So those girders tend to be a little larger. And that's actually what happened on the last slide because the last slide, you know, we've got these beams, you can see the girder, the girder just looks bigger uh, than the beams that are framing into it. It's because it's responsible for more area. But what happens is, uh, from an analysis standpoint, usually we, um, are, depending upon the number of beams that frame into it, sometimes what we'll do is we'll um, instead idealize the girder. Instead of seeing a bunch of distributed loads, it sees a bunch of point loads. And where do those point loads come from? They come from the reactions from the beams, okay? So, for example, if we look at these anterior girders, there's one, two, three, four points where the, um, the girders frame in, and you can see one, two, three, four loads, uh, uh, concentrated loads that are applied. And those loads are essentially the reactions uh, on either end. We get into the math about, uh, about that component um, a little bit uh, later, and I, and I don't want to go too far down the weeds of beam analysis and girder analysis because... 
it'll be easier to sort of follow that when we've drawn shear diagrams and moment diagrams uh, later on. For now, I just want you to get this idea of halfway over uh, to the next adjacent element. That halfway idea, if you understand that, that that's pretty much uh, all you'll need uh, to know. Um, the other thing I kind of want to discuss from a background standpoint is um, the actual products that we're going to use. Now, in this project, um, we're going to be um, utilizing steel elements, and the reason there are a couple reasons why it's not um, uh, because uh, um, of some uh, uh, bias towards steel or anything. Uh, mainly because the, um, uh, the 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 design process that we're going to use. It's kind of nice if we have a catalog of shapes to select from, and steel provides a very uh, nice catalog to go off of. Um, we're also going to be using a software package that uh, makes. Uh, that using steel makes our lives a little easier. And you'll see what I mean as we, we get into the, um, uh, uh, the project. Now, if we're talking about steel, there are two hot rolled steel products that we uh, tend to use uh, in structural engineering. The first is um, a combination of plates and bars. So you can take plates and bars and fabricate them into uh, all sorts of elements that you would need in a structure, such as plate girders or gusset plates or other connecting elements uh, for a structure. Uh, but the other uh, are rolled shapes, and rolled shapes are when we, um, uh, uh, you know, have you know a, a product of steel that is successively uh, passed through uh, pressurized rollers that compress it into a shape like a channel or a W shape uh, or, or what have you. Um, you've probably heard the term I-beams before. We don't really use uh, uh, the term I-beam anymore because there are various different shapes that could be classified as an I-beam, such as a W-shape, an S-shape, we have HP shapes uh, and what have you um, uh, for, for piles and whatnot. The most common uh, I-shape uh, that we use is called a wide flange or a W-shape, and it's just because of the configuration or the ratio between the flanges and the webs, that wide flanges are the most common uh, used structural steel uh, product for beams and columns, uh, uh, period. That's, that's typically what we're using here in the United States. Um, and we have a particular way of referencing um, uh, uh, rolled shapes, and this is what I want to make sure that everybody's familiar with. If you're currently taking um, civil engineering materials, if you haven't already discussed this, you will. Um, uh, uh, if, if not, you'll, you'll hear this next semester. And if you take, take me for steel design, we'll definitely be talking about this really early on. Um, but the, we have a particular way of naming rolled shapes. Um, and I want to just show you how that works by considering, let's say, a W27 by 129. Each of those values uh, has a particular meaning. So, so first off, the W refers to the classification of the shape. So is it a W shape? Is it a, is it a WT? Is it a channel such as a C shape is, you know, uh, and what have you? Um, so the W refers to the shape classification. Well, what about the 27 and the 129? Well, the 27 is about how deep it is or its nominal depth. So for a W27, its depth is about 27 inches. They're not exactly 27 inches. So if you look at the family, like all possible W27s, they're not all exactly 27 inches deep. But because of the, uh, the rolling family that they're in, they're about 27 inches deep. But the 129, that's a number you can take to the bank. And the 129 refers to the shape's longitudinal weight. So a W27 by 129 is a W shape that is about 27 inches deep and weighs 129 pounds per foot. And so from a uh, selection standpoint, the, uh, the naming of W shapes and the naming of steel, uh, uh, steel sections in general usually makes our lives a little easier from a design standpoint. Because if I had a choice between let's say a W27 by 84 and a W24 by 76, all things being equal, which one would I choose? I would probably choose the W24 by 76 because it's lighter. And why does the, light, uh, the lighter uh, uh, aspect matter? Well, for one, money. Um, the lighter the shape, the less pounds of steel you are purchasing, which means if you're paying on a per pound basis, that means you're spending less money. Um, so the naming of rolled shapes really makes our life a little easier. A lot of times in steel design, what we're doing is we're just finding the shape that has the smallest second number because that's the one that's uh, the lightest. It's not always the case, but um, gives you kind of an idea uh, of where we're going with this. Okay, so those two ideas in mind, looking at um, uh, rolled shapes and then this idea of tributary area, I want to kind of go through um, how you would do a, a, a truss layout. And by that, I mean... Uh, laying it out, sizing the members, computing deflections, uh, even determining the final price 
and I kind of want to show you how that works. So I want to go through an example project exercise. Now, none of these parameters are going to match the parameters that you have in your project, but you can kind of get an idea of how the, the math would work uh, and whatnot. And I'll give you some, some pointers and tips that might make your life a, a little easier uh, negotiating the project. Um, so let's just go through some numbers. We're going to lay out a truss, let's say, for a 60-foot span. So let's assume our bridge is 60 foot long. Again, the one for your project is going to be way longer. Um, but let's say it's a 60 foot span. Let's assume the bridge is 24 feet wide. Um, so that um, uh, uh, it is, and we are sizing the truss so it needs to support a load of, let's say, 1,400 pounds per square foot. Now, just full stop, um, 1,400 pounds per square foot is a really large load. <laughs> it's really large. Um, but we're going to assume that 1,400 pounds per square foot accounts for the self weight of the bridge. It accounts for the pedestrian load, and it also accounts for additional safety factors or load factors that go into it. You'll learn really quickly in either steel design or concrete design that we, we uh, seldom deal with nominal loads when, when designing members. Instead, we deal with factored loads. So we increase the magnitude of the loads to account for uncertainties uh, and whatnot. And I don't want to steal the limelight from steel design or concrete design. I just want to mention that when you're dealing in factored loads, sometimes those loads can get kind of large. Now, in laying this truss out, we're going to employ the following limits. We're going to limit our member selection to W12s, um, which is also pretty common uh, a lot of times in detailing. When you have a family of, of members, you kind of want to limit them to a selection of W12s or W14s because it can make it easier to uh, uh, connect them if they're all roughly the same depth. Um, now, in order to analyze the structure, we know now we need a, a Young's modulus and elastic modulus for steel, so we'll take that to be 29,000 KSI. Um, we're going to limit the axial stress on each member to 36 KSI, and this is how we're going to do our initial member selection. Um, and we're also going to say that the mid-span vertical deflection of the truss is limited to 2 inches. Okay. Um, and then when it's all said and done, we're going to compute the cost uh, per truss. We're just going to look at a per... Um, uh, trust uh, assessment. And we're going to assume that steel costs a buck forty a pound. So here's the process uh, that we're going to employ, um, and I'm going to walk us through it. We're going to uh, take a take our time with this. So we're going to use the constraints and the guidelines uh, of the project to lay out the trust system, um, and you'll you'll see what I mean about that here in a bit. Um, we're going to use tributary area to determine the joint loads on the truss, and then we're going to analyze the truss. Um, once we've analyzed the truss and we've got the force in each member, we're going to use the stress value, the stress limits to select a member. Um, and then, then once we have the member selected, each member is going to have a cross-sectional area. And then now that we have the cross-sectional area, we'll be able to check the vertical deflection limits. Um, there's a good chance that after you check the vertical deflection limits, the truss will have deflected too much uh, and then you will need to iterate. Uh, and select new members uh, and, and redo your computations, um, if necessary. Maybe you're lucky and you're good, maybe not. Um, but as, but at, basically at the end of this step, we want to know that our members meet both the stress limit requirements and the deflection limits uh, on the structure as a whole. Uh, and finally, we need to compute the cost of the truss once it's all uh, said and done. So let's say here's the truss. Um, and for this demo, I'm keeping the truss real simple. We're assuming that we're, we're just using a really basic layout of the truss. And remember, the bridge is 24 feet wide. Um, so we'll have two trusses, one on either end. Um, and we're going to keep all the members at a one to one slope ratio. And we're just uh, we're going to focus on one truss for the for the for the bulk of this example. So we'll do all the calculations necessary to figure out the loads on one truss. And then we'll just look at that one truss from then on out, because if you design one, the other is going to be the exact same. So here's the, the truss that we'll look at. Um, now, I'm just sort of assuming that this truss meets project constraints. And what I mean by project constraints, and you'll see this in your uh, specific uh, submittal run request, but um, there will be limits uh, about the envelope that the bridge can exist in, the um, member length limitations and what have you. So you're going to see some limitations um, uh, here in a bit, uh, but I'll... Um, uh, I, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole on this. Now, in order to analyze this truss, we need to have some joint loads. We need to have some loads applied to the structure. Uh, and so in order to do that, we're going to use the concept of tributary area. Okay. Now, the way this is going to work is um, let's go back to the um, uh, 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 the basic parameters of the, um, uh, of the project. We know that the 
trusses apply has a pressure load of 1400 pounds per square foot and we know that the bridge width is 24 feet so we know that this dimension right here um, is 24 feet uh, long okay now we also know that each joint is 10 feet apart okay so the distance from joint to joint uh, right here is 10 feet okay so how do we determine the load uh, on each joint well first off we have to recognize that you know looking at the truss if you were standing on this truss you know where would the load go well it would go to the deck and then it would go to the floor beams and the load would go to the joints on the bottom of the truss so so what we would be seeing is a load here a load here a load here uh, etc okay so how do we determine those loads well we need tributary area so if I'm looking, let's say, at that joint right there, okay, well, I respond, I, I would um, uh, 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 stipulate that the floor that's halfway over to the next joint and halfway over to the next joint, that all of that floor is going to go to that joint, and that's going to happen until we get to the middle of the road. And then from the middle of the road, the rest of the uh, 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 deck going the other way is going to go to the other truss, okay? So what we need is the area of that shaded region, okay? And I propose that the area of the shaded region is 120 square feet. Um, now, how did I get that? Well, if the entire um, bridge is 24 feet wide, half of that deck is going to go to the left truss, half of that deck is going to go to the right truss. So I take that width and divide it by 2 to get this dimension here. So that dimension right there uh, is 12 feet. And as for... This dimension right here, how do I get that dimension? I know that's kind of shaded, that's kind of hard to see. Let me let me do a, 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 maybe a plan view on that. So here's the truss, here's the truss, and let's say that these dots here represent the, the truss joints, you, you can see right here. So that tributary area for that joint is gonna go something about like that. That's gonna be the tributary area for that joint. And so if this dimension is 12 feet, this dimension here, well, it's five foot there, five foot there, so it's 10 feet. So the tributary area for that joint is 120 square feet, and then all I have to do is take that tributary area, multiply it by the pressure load, and I get 168,000 pounds. So 120 uh, square feet times 1400 PSF, and I get 168,000 pounds or 168 kips. And that's the load applied to each joint. It's that simple, okay? So if I, um, let me erase all this because I had a note popping up here. Let me erase all that. Uh, sorry. So the idea now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that is the load on a joint, but notice all the joints on that uh, uh, bottom segment of the truss, they all have the same joint spacing. So we're gonna have the same point load applied to all the joints. Um, so what do we have? Um, we have this. Now, uh, one thing I, I, I will mention is that, you know, some of you uh, astute observers might be thinking, okay, well, what about, you know, the load from here to here, right? What about that region, right? Because if you go halfway from joint to joint, well, what about the load on the very end? Well, the load on the very end, uh, what we're doing is we're assuming that that would just go to the supports. So we'll just conservatively neglect it. So if we, you know, are standing on the truss, uh, uh, on the deck of the truss, and we're only about like a foot or two on the bridge, we just assume that for the sake of discussion, that load would go directly to the, to the supports. So the geotech engineer or what, uh, uh, whoever's looking at what is supporting the, uh, uh, the truss, they would need to consider that load. But if we're just looking at sizing the truss elements, we'll just uh, conservatively neglect that. So here is our truss, okay? So we have the truss. Now this just becomes a plain truss analysis problem. I can take the truss, I can determine support reactions, I can apply method of joints, work my way through the truss, and there we go. I've got truss forces, right? So I've skipped a lot of math, but that part is um, is pretty easy, okay? Now, I know my camera here, oh no, it didn't cover it, that's great. So one point I would mention is we do have a zero force member in the truss. We have a, um, a member in the very middle that's a zero force, um, a zero force element you'll see where um, that element, uh, where that uh, is coming into play here in a bit, but I did want to include one zero force member in the truss uh, just for discussion purposes, okay? So we've got the truss, we've analyzed the truss, um, now we can select members, 
Okay, so the way that we're going to select members is we're going to use our stress limits. Okay, so first off, we were um, limiting our stress uh, our selection to W12s, and then we have stress limits um, where our stresses are limited to uh, 36 ksi. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, um, I've got um, sigma equals p over a, so I can rearrange that and say that the area has to be greater than p over sigma. So I can find a minimum area for each member by just taking the, the load on that member and dividing it by 36 ksi. So let's just use a member from our, our previous slide here. I'll go back a couple of slides. Let's, let's look at member hi. So member hi is this member right here. Okay, and so member HI has 672 kips and compression. That just comes from our method of joints analysis. So uh, it has 672 kips and compression. Uh, and so I take that and I divide it by um, uh, 36 KSI and I get 18.67 square inches. Okay, and so what's the smallest member that can safely resist that load? So what I would just do is go to my catalog of, um, of W shapes uh, and say, okay, here's my catalog. Here's all of the uh, potential W shapes uh, that would work. Uh, and I have a W12 by 65. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. I wanna see if I can uh, pull up the W shape table. Give me one second. All right, so here's our W shapes uh, from the steel manual. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. So if we go back to our previous slide, um, let me go here and go back a slide. We got 18.67 square inches. Um, so what we're gonna do is go to our W shape. So here's the listing of W shapes, and this is all the W12s uh, all in one section. So we look here and we see, okay, we can see the shapes and they're listed by area. And so we find the smallest shape that we can that has an area of 18.67 square inches. So for example, we could use a W, I don't know, like a W12 by 120, because it has an area of 35.2. We could use a W20 by 106. We could keep going until we hit a W12 by 65. So a W12 by 65 has an area of 19.1 square inches. Once we get to the W12 by 58, it's too small. It only has an area of 17 square inches and we need 18.67. Um, so, so selecting the members is pretty easy. We just find, um, we just find the smallest member that we can. So the lightest member, the one that has that smallest second number uh, that can support that load. And then we just do that for all the other members in the truss, okay? Um, and uh, one thing I'll point out, if you remember that central member was a zero force member. So I just picked the smallest W12 that was available, uh, a W12 by 14. Um, and again, for this uh, uh, project, we're not considering brace forces or are really moving loads or anything like that because we're just assuming the pedestrian load uh, is everywhere. Um, so we're not gonna get into that. So we'll just assume the, the smallest W12. Now, here's the thing. Now we have a member. We have a member um, selected for every uh, 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 element in the truss. So now we have an area for every member. So if we have an area for every element in the truss, now we can uh, compute deflections. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look, gonna look at mid-span deflections. So now we'll do a virtual analysis. We'll apply a single unit load directly in the middle of the truss, um, get our support reactions, uh, compute our um, uh, virtual forces, uh, and then now we can apply the, uh, the method of virtual work. Take our little Fs times our big Fs times L over EA. Now, there's a lot of members in this truss, so the way that we would do that is just break out the, um, the wonderful world of Excel. Um, so here you can see I've done that. So I've got all of the members uh, organized. And I, on the left, I tried to make it a little easier to, uh, 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 to understand because I've got the bottom cords, the top cords, the vertical members, and the diagonal members kind of grouped together. Uh, and you can see I've got all the shapes uh, indicated. Uh, I've got the, the little Fs, the big Fs, the Ls, the Es, and then the As. I'm not using Amen. I'm using the actual areas of each of those shapes. I'm computing the energies, and I'm summing everything up, and I got a problem. Because if you look at the very bottom, I'm getting a deflection of 2.2 inches. And that is too much. If you remember, we were uh, constrained to selecting a structure that had a deflection of two inches or less. So that's too big. The truss is deflecting too much. Um, so the way that we need to handle that is we need to take these members and we need to reselect some members. We need to take some members and we need to make them bigger. Okay. Now, the way that I like to do that is I like to look at the members with the largest amount of, of 
stored energy, the ones with the largest FFL over EA values, and I like to resize them first. So I'll look at the column on the very right, and as an example, I'll look at this, and let's take a look, for example, at these two members. Those are the top chords in the very middle. Those, uh, I believe, have the biggest energy components of all of the uh, um, uh, members in the truss. Uh, so if I look, I you can see I picked a W12 by 72. What I'll do is I'll take each one of those members and make them one size bigger and then change the areas and see if that uh, affects the deflection. And so what I will do is I will just keep iterating that over and over again until I get something like this. And so what I would do is iterate the... Uh, to pick those first two, change those size, and then keep going. And I would keep going and keep going until I get to a point when the deflections are less than two inches. Okay. And if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at the, um, uh, the what we've done, we've taken the members and we've made them bigger. So by making them bigger, um, we know that we've increased the areas. So we don't have to recheck stresses because we know we meet the stress limits by default. That's not a problem because we've met them before. We certainly meet them now. Um, and you can see what we ended up doing uh, for the most part is changing all of our top chords and the bottom chords, but uh, a couple of the bottom chords, but everything else uh, remained the same. So here's the final structure. This is the final member selection. This is the one that meets all of the stress limits and deflection limits uh, stipulated in the project. And so the last remaining steps is just draw it up and compute the cost. And how am I computing the cost? Well, it's pretty easy. We assume that steel uh, is about 40 uh, a pound. Um, and the weight of each member, uh, all we do is we say, okay, we take, let's just took the very first one. So the very first one is a W12 by 40. So it weighs, oh, sorry, dropped my pen. So it weighs uh, 40 pounds per foot. So 40 pounds per foot. It is 10 feet long or 120 inches. So I, I have 120 inches because when I did my virtual work uh, assessment, I, I used inches for the member length because you have to have consistent units. So just make sure you're conscious of your unit calculations. So 40 pounds per foot per 10 feet is 400 pounds. So just add up all the weight till you get about 10,600 pounds, 10,600 pounds times the cost. Here's your dollar figure. So I propose that truss um, costs about 14,900 bucks, okay? So my goal for everybody in the class is to try and um, come up with a uh, uh, as optimal a design as possible. At one point, I might tell you what my cost is for my design, and I want to see if you can beat me. Uh, we might have some fun with that. Uh, okay. All right. So what's going to happen in, in the class project that we have is you're going to have uh, uh, parameters for your trust. Okay. So uh, let's go through those and make sure that we're all uh, clear on that. Okay, oh, what happened there? Let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay, so your truss is going to be subjected to the following constraints. So this is going to be the project uh, that you're going to have to uh, assess. Uh, so the first thing that you're going to have to do is for your truss layout, um, your IT value is going to have to be zero, and, and it must be stable. Now, the trusses are going to be externally stable by default. Uh, 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 that should be the case since they're all simply supported. Um, but you're going to have to verify for the layout that you develop that IT uh, is zero. You're going to have to check that for some middle one. Um, so the, uh, the truss will uh, uh, have uh, IE by zero by default. Um, so again, simply supported, that's not going to be an issue. Um, one constraint that you're going to have to meet is that vertical. So what we're going to do is we're going to have stress limits and we're going to have vertical deflection limits. Um, the vertical deflection is going to be checked by measuring the lowest joint at mid span. So you have to have a joint there. Okay. So for example, what you can't have is a truss. Let's say the truss has like five members. Well, the middle wouldn't have a joint. It would just have a member there. You have to have a joint in the middle of the bridge in order to um, check deflection. So there must be a joint at mid-span along the bottom of the truss. Um, one of the things I'm going to impose upon you are member length limitations. So um, for example, I'll give you a number and every year the number changes. Let's say the number is 30 feet this year. It may, may be 30 feet, it may not. I, I, uh, I'll let you see on on the uh, the submittal. But if if I say the member the number is thirty feet, then no individual trust member can exceed thirty feet. So you're going to have to check that uh, as well. Um, I am going to give you an envelope limitation, and so what I mean by the envelope limitation is that the trust must not exceed an envelope plus or minus, and I'm calling it alpha. So plus or minus alpha feet 
from the walkway. So for example, if here's the walkway and here's the person walking it, the truss can't be, um, let's say the number is 10 feet. So it can't be 10 feet from the walkway above or 10 feet from the walkway uh, below. So you could have a truss that's uh, uh, above the walkway or a truss that's below the walkway. Either one's possible, it's totally up to you. Um, you're going to have to submit two uh, uh, deliverables in this project. So let's talk about submittal one. Submittal one, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take uh, the project constraints and develop three conceptual truss elevations. So three conceptual layouts of a truss uh, for the, the project constraints that I've assigned. Uh, you can do them, you can draw them by hand, you can do it in CAD. I, I, I'm not really worried about that for submittal one. I just want to make sure that, that it's done neatly. For each truss, you need to verify that IT is zero, um, and that it meets uh, all of the associated um, uh, 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 dimensional requirements. You also, in submittal one, need to develop a selection strategy and choose one concept of design. Now, I'm actually not going to tell you what, uh, what that selection strategy is. I'm going to let you decide. Uh, so as an example, the selection strategy might be you picked the trust with the fewest number of members, or you picked the truss um, based on independent research, you picked it based on aesthetics, whatever is fine, but I want you to have a means by which you select one truss versus uh, the other. So you're gonna submit three truss elevations and choose one. You're gonna submit a single PDF for that. Um, I need a sketch for each of the trusts uh, along with the associated IT computations, and I need a small write-up explaining why you chose your concept. Doesn't need to be that long, just maybe a paragraph or so, but that's gonna be your submittal one. And submittal one's gonna be sort of the, the easier um, uh, submission. Uh, submittal two is the one that's going to take uh, a little bit of work. That's the one um, that uh, is going to require a couple deliverables. So what you're going to do from uh, uh, after submittal one, so in the first submittal you uh, drew up three trusses and then picked one. For that second truss or that, for that second submittal where you've picked the one truss, you're going to um, go through the exercise of selecting trust members that meet both the stress limits that are imposed and the deflection limits that are imposed. And by the way, the deflection limits uh, in this presentation, I said two inches, it's probably not going to be two inches, it's going to be uh, something else. For the um, stress limits, I said 36 KSI, it might be something else uh, on the handout. Every year it changes, so you'll just have to review the handout and see. Uh, for submittal two, you're going to submit three things. You're going to submit a CAD drawing that shows your final truss elevation, uh, including the member selection and all the dimensions and all that. You're gonna submit a set of associated computations uh, for all, all, the, all the tasks that we've done, uh, the truss analysis, truss deflections, all that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a lot of what we've talked about today, hopefully you're sort of picking up that Excel uh, uh, might be a, a very uh, friendly tool. And so the, the calculations can be done by hand or it can just be a spreadsheet. As long as it's professional and, and, and easy to navigate, that, that's all that matters. Um, the third, you are going to have a, another item that you have to submit uh, for submittal two, uh, and it's a set of results from a structural analysis, a piece of, of software. Um, we're going to talk about that later. Um, we haven't gone about gone through that yet, but um, the long story short is that the um, software package that we're going to use is going to make the trust analysis easier. So I might um, I might suggest holding off doing a bunch of trust analysis because we're going to have a program that's going to make our life easier a, a little later. Um, and finally, I am going to give you some tips and tricks uh, for the project um, and some things that, you know, uh, that I have found that might make your life a, a little easier. Um, so first off, um, I, I would strongly suggest that you consider a truss that is symmetric, symmetric about the center line. Truss symmetry is your best friend. Um, it will make the detailing, the, the process easier. It's sort of less to deal with. Like if you have 41 members, you really only need to consider 21 of them, whatever members in the middle, and then the, the um, uh, 20 on one side. Um, if trust symmetry is your friend, Microsoft Excel is your best friend. Um, so the more calculations you can do in Excel, the better. It will make your life a little easier. I have some uh, um, resources that I'm going to um, provide you. One of those is an Excel sheet that contains the areas of all of the W shapes. Um, and there are tools or tips and tricks that you can use to make your life a little easier uh, when referencing those. Um, I would say avoid zero force members in the real structure if possible. Um, sometimes it's not. 
uh, and so maybe you need to minimize them. Uh, you you um, you just want to make sure that your structure is as efficient as possible. There are some solutions where you could have some zero force members, and it's actually quite optimal. Um, I would just try and avoid too many of them because you want your your um, uh, uh, structure to be uh, valuable. Um, I do think that you can use the IT expression to help develop your geometry. Uh, and so what I mean by that is um, if you're just trying to lay out some trusses, um, you can you know, calculate the IT offhand, figure out maybe you need an extra joint. Maybe you need a couple extra members to get your IT value uh, to zero and that can help out. Uh, and finally, don't be afraid to be creative with your truss layout. One of the things I'm actually not really discussing is actually what is a good idea for a truss layout because I want you to do some independent research on that. Um, I, I've been very um, uh, uh, reserved in going through that because I want you to explore that on your own. There's no real wrong answer for the purposes of the project. Um, I just want you to um, have done the work to develop some truss solutions that make sense. I will say that the more complex the truss, it can, it, it can result in, it might seem like it's resulting in more work. I'm not sure that it actually is because everybody's going to have to develop a, um, an, uh, a, a computer model of the structure. Everybody's going to have to do uh, the same cost estimate uh, and the same iteration. And once you start utilizing some software to make your life a little easier, it, it's sort of the same amount of work. Um, if you have a, a, a modest number of members or maybe a, a little more. So like if one student has 40 members in their trust and one student has 50 members in their trust, I don't think either of them are really going to see that much more work uh, at the end of the day. Um, maybe if you had 300 members, maybe then it starts to become uh, a, a little bit more work. So, But if, if everybody's got a roughly the same amount, uh, it, it shouldn't add uh, 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 too many hours uh, doing doing the project. And again, I think you'll find this project isn't actually a lot of work. It's it's pretty pretty manageable, pretty straightforward. Um, with that, that I'm going to close this uh, lecture out. I'm going to post the project uh, constraints for this year's project uh, on Blackboard, uh, as well as some of the tools I've mentioned uh, earlier to make your life a little easier. Uh, and we might talk about some tips and tricks uh, with Excel. Uh, a little later. I might post those uh, here in a bit or append these uh, uh, to the playlist. Uh, with that, that's all I've got, um, and I will see you uh, next time.